It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. Teresa Coates is a nationally known sewing educator for Shannon Fabrics. Also an accomplished quilt maker, travel writer, pattern designer, and relentless adventurer. She wants you to fall in love with sewing. As the national educator for Shannon Fabrics, Teresa created Sew Together Tuesday in 2020. She plans, produces, and hosts every episode, inviting the audience in for a fun, encouraging, and interactive experience. Teresa and I recorded this episode back in April, so it will make more sense when you hear that she has only been in Kansas City since February. Teresa, thank you so much for joining us on A Quilter's Life. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Share with us where you were born and raised. So I was actually born in Colorado. My dad was in the military, and so I was born at the Army base in Colorado, but I grew up most of my life in California and then in Oregon, so completely on the West Coast after I was just a few months old. Most of the time I lived in one house in Newburgh, Oregon, from the time that I was six until I was 18. So it was just one and done. I was just there. So yeah, California and Oregon. Was that Northern or Southern California? Northern California. I lived in Sacramento area. Oh, great. So you spent a lot of time in Oregon. Do you have a special childhood memory from there? I think my favorite childhood memories are really kind of the whole massive. We did a lot of outdoor stuff when I was little, and I really appreciate that. We went camping and we went hiking and we'd go motorbiking and fishing and we went ice fishing and camping in the snow and all sorts of fun stuff. I really treasure having grown up in a very beautiful area and having my parents kind of treat me to that and take me outside and let me see it and really grow to love it. Because even now I really love Oregon. You mentioned ice fishing, and whenever I think ice fishing, I think Alaska or something like that, but they had ice fishing in Oregon? Yeah, because in the winter, it gets cold enough that up in the mountains, if you go up into the high lake, so we went up to Timothy Lake is where we went, which is up near Mount Hood, and the lake actually freezes a foot deep or so, and we went out there with the big thing and did the big crank, and yeah, drilled a hole in the ice, and we did it twice. We had to hike up into the lake. It was super fun. Yeah. I can't picture how cold that would have to be for the ice to be that thick. Very cold. It was not comfortable to sleep outside. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about your employment. So I work for Shannon Fabrics. I'm the national educator for Shannon Fabrics. And if you don't know who they are, they're the people who make minky fabrics. So all of their fabrics are plush, really kind of luxurious fabrics. And I work for them full time. I've been with them for about seven years now teaching classes, and then we do some online stuff. So I love it. I love teaching. It's absolutely wonderful. And my job lets me get to be creative and have a lot of fun with a fabric that I didn't really work with otherwise. So I've been learning as I go and being able to learn and then kind of teach and be creative. And yeah, it's a fabulous job. I absolutely love it. Well, now I know you went through a lot of steps to get to that company. Can you share with us what steps you went through? Yeah. So I thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom is where I originally began my career. And then I got divorced and I had to find a path. So I actually went to college and I took English classes and I thought I would work in publishing is what I wanted to do. And so after I graduated from college as a single mom, I ended up finding a job at Fab Shop News, which is a quilt industry magazine. So I was working in publishing and then I found there was this magazine that was for the sewing industry. And I was like, what? (laughs) Super curious. Like, oh, I can put my two things together. Like, I love sewing. I love writing. Let's do this. So I got hired by them and I worked with them for a few years. I then worked with Robert Kaufman Fabrics. I did their social media for a while. I worked in a few fabric stores. I started my own tiny little Crinkle Dreams company doing patterns. And then I ended up moving to Shannon Fabrics, like I said, about seven years ago. So it's just kind of taking these little steps. And along the way, probably about a decade ago or so, I started teaching at quilt shops. So while I was working at the quilt shop, I would teach classes or 
when I was working. I can't remember where I was working at one point, and then I was teaching classes at Modern Domestic. So I kind of like just stuck in teaching stuff when I could. And that really got me fired up for the idea that I love teaching. And that was when I was like, okay, I know which route I need to be on now. And then that landed me here, which is really the ideal place for me to be. Mm -hmm. I take it the job with Shannon Fabrics brought you back to California. So the job with Shannon brought me to California. Yep. So when I worked for Kaufman, I had to move to California. And then I left that job and I moved back to Oregon because I really needed to be around family. And then when I got hired again by a fabric company in Los Angeles, I was like, okay, so do I have to move back to LA? And they said, you do, you're going to travel a lot, but you have to be here. And so I was like, okay, all right, we'll do that. So I did. I basically up and moved in about three weeks. My daughter had just graduated from high school and I said, okay, do you want to stay here? Do you want to come with me? She said, I'll stay here. So she did. She's still up in Portland and I moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. Do you get up there much to see her? I have two kids up in Portland and my son Stuart is a little bit older and I get up there fairly often. This last year, because we traveled and we were on the road a bunch, I got to get up there actually a little bit more to stay for some periods. And that was lovely. But we're no longer in California. We actually moved to Kansas City just the beginning of February. So now we're in Kansas City. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's funny because I was picturing you in California. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If you had the opportunity to talk to your great, great grandchildren, in the future, what would you want them to know about you? I think I would want them to know that I always tried to do more, be better, learn, challenge myself. Yeah. Try the hard stuff. Yeah. It's one of the things that I think I'm probably most proud of in my life is that like I've been willing to take on challenges that seemed like they would be maybe too hard. But that that's actually led me to so much, so much more in my life by just taking the challenges and not taking the easy road. So I think I'd want them to know that. Thank you. That is something to really strive for. Besides quilting, are there other crafts that you do or have done in the past? So I used to, when I was a kid, I did a bunch of cross stitch when I was a kid, like a teenager, I did a bunch of cross stitch and I did plastic canvas in my early twenties. I did a lot of paper cutting. I got really into that whole hobby. I think I've done a lot of little stuff here and there. I tend to be one who really dives into the hobby. So I'll do that pretty hard and not really, I'm consecutive in my hobbies and not multifaceted at one point. Does that make sense? So like, and I did a lot of sewing and I think really sewing just in general has been the hobby that's been most predominant in my life. But yeah, I've done a lot of different little things, but pretty much if it has to do with fabric, I've wanted to do it. I've tried yarn arts. I've tried crochet. I've tried knit. I don't really like it. I tried latch hooking. I don't really like it. I'm willing to try anything, but really the ones that I've stuck with are basically fabric related. Mm -hmm. How about other hobbies in your life? So lately, I've been trying to learn embroidery, like hand embroidery. And that's been kind of fun because I was able to take it with me on the road when I was traveling a lot. And so it was something that I could keep quite a bit of floss and the hoops and the needle. None of it took up a lot of space. So quilting on the road is much harder because you can't really take a stash with you. So taking the embroidery was a lot easier. And I did some little bitty pieces and I've been working on some bigger pieces. And most of those I'll be honest, have just been from kits or from books following patterns. So I haven't gotten very creative in it, but it's been very satisfying to keep my hands busy and to still make stuff because I do love making. It's so hard for me to not jump ahead, but obviously your embroidery came in handy in making the little bunnies that you just posted. (laughs) Yes. Learning how to do some hand stitching has really helped. Just learning how to control a needle. Yes, totally. Which brings me to my next question of, do any of your hobbies or other crafts show up in your quilting? I think not as much as I would like to yet. So one of the things about learning some more about embroidery and practicing stitches and just learning how to control the needle and the thread and how to make it do what I want it to do. 
taking that into the next step is really what I want to do. So in the next iteration of me over the next year here in Kansas City, I really want to try to kind of marry the two of the quilting and the embroidery. I really find myself really attracted to quilts that have embroidery on them. And I really want to take some of the inspiration that I found on the road, things that I want to share and put them into quilts. So I want to do a quilt series about some of the travels and I, I want to get the embroidery in there. I really do. It's interesting how they interconnect sometimes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about who introduced you to quilting. So I don't really know when I was introduced to quilting per se. So as a child, we grew up with some quilts that my great grandmother had made. But I really only met my great grandmother a couple of times. She lived in Arizona and we lived in Oregon, but we always had them around the house. So we always had quilts around. And I think a lot of people have childhoods like that, that they have quilts around. They don't really know where they came from or a connection to them, but they're there. And that was kind of me. And when I was pregnant with my son, I had the idea that every baby needs a quilt and I don't know exactly where it came from, but every baby needs a quilt. And I still believe that. So that was when I decided I was going to figure out how to make a quilt and I had sewn. So I had sewn for 10 years or so at that point. So I had some sewing skills, machine sewing skills. I found some books at the library about quilt making and I borrowed them and I made photocopies of some of the pages and I ended up not making any of them that book, though I still have copies from that book from 30 years ago, which I think is pretty funny. But I ended up actually using the first quilt I made was with a pattern that was in like a, just a supermarket magazine. You know, they have the quilting magazines at the supermarket. And it was one of those. And it was actually, to circle it back, it was actually one that I did cross stitch and some patchwork that that was the pattern. And that was my very first quilt. So I think the idea of quilting and quilt making was always sort of in my family and in my life, but I hadn't really glommed onto it until I had a baby and then I needed to start quilting. I agree. Every baby needs its own quilt. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Whether it's a quilt that you made or someone else, do you have a favorite quilt? A favorite quilt is really hard to pick. One, when you've been quilt making for a long time, you kind of forget some of the quilts that you made and given away. So like, I don't have any pictures of some quilts that I've made and I don't have a list of quilts that I've made, which I would say if I were starting over, I would do that. I would keep a list of all of the quilts that I made and who I gave them to. It would probably help me answer this question a little better. Because for me, it's really like, what's either the project that I'm working or the latest one that I did? The latest one that I did is my favorite right now. And that's one that I made for my boyfriend, Hawk. And it is, I'm not going to remember the right name. It was for the Mars rover or something that landed. And it's like, it looks like the balloon that landed because he's a space nut. And so I made a quilt that sort of signifies that, that landing on Mars. And I really love the way that it turned out. It was all my own creation of that, like having to try to replicate this and how do I make that work and tracing pieces out and getting the right angles with things and sewing all of these. There's, I think there's 80 wedges in the quilt and doing this enormous circle and then having it custom quilted was just like at the end, it's just this masterpiece. I feel like I'm very happy with it right now. So give me another five years and I'll have another, you know, favorite that I'm like, oh, but this one, this is the best I've ever done. But for right now, that's kind of my favorite. Yeah. Oh, well. Did you have to paper piece that then to get those angles? I I didn't. I actually just patchwork pieced it, but it was a lot of measurements and a lot of just careful quarter inch, very careful quarter inch sewing. I actually had to try it twice because the first time I didn't get the angles right. So it ended up being kind of a 3D quilt and it didn't lay flat. So I had to redo things and I tried to like pull in seam allowances and all that stuff in it. Yeah, I just ended up having to remake the quilt. So I've actually made it twice. The second one turned out. Practice makes perfect. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) And if it doesn't work the first time, you try, try again. As I watched you making that bunny, how many times you had to make it before you did it for the YouTube. So, wow, you make a lot of everything you make. I make a lot of everything. Yeah, making it twice doesn't freak me out. 
that was a big project to make twice, but I learned something every time. I always feel like the first one is practice. No matter what I'm making, the first one is practice. Is there a tool that you are so happy that you have? My favorite tool, the one that makes me the happiest is the by Annie Stiletto, which is such a funny little tool to be in love with. But I love the way that it works. It has such a good handhold. It lets me get really close to the needle and hold fabrics exactly where I want them to. It lets me pick out paper when I'm doing paper piecing. It holds the binding over when I'm stitching it down. It's the next finger that I need, but with way more control and precision. So I absolutely love it. So it's my very favorite tool. (laughs) It's great. You showed it to me. So it looks like the grip on that is really nice. It's a lovely tool. And like it has kind of a pencil hold to it. So it's really easy to hold in your hands while you're working with it. The thing I really like the best is this big metal point here. And it's actually, so this sounds like an advertisement and it sounds like it every time, but I truly do love this. But it's sandblasted here. So it actually grabs the fabric. It has a little bit of grip. So it doesn't ever snag the fabric, but it grips it just a little bit, which is the game changer in trying to make it do the job I need it to do, which is holding fabric where I can't hold it. I can't get that close to the needle. I've never sewn through my finger and I'm never going to because I use this thing instead. (laughs) I am so happy to hear that because so many times it sounds like it's not if, but when, and I don't want that when to happen. No. No, I'm avoiding it as long as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. With all the steps in quilting, is there a specific step that you really look forward to? Or do you like each step along the way? I think the part that I like best about quilt making is actually the putting it together. Actually seeing the blocks and those pieces come together and make the thing that you wanted it to make. That's the part that gets exciting for me because a lot of times I'm choosing designs or patterns that are a little bit more complicated. So as you're making the blocks, you're like, I hope this is going to work. They say it's going to (laughs) work. And I don't really know until I get it and I start piecing it together. And then all of a sudden I can see it come together. And I feel like that's my, my MO for sewing too. Like when I'm making a bag and all of a sudden I get to flip it out and I'm like, yes, it worked. It's a thing. That moment is really exciting for me. So I think in quilt making, it's that same where I'm starting to get the blocks together and it's becoming a thing. And then I have a really hard time stopping. So I can piecemeal out the blocks a little bit at a time and I'm fine. But once it starts going together, I'm like, the whole thing has to go. I got to see it finished. I call this my fun question. Tell us about your worst quilting experience. I have two terrible quilting experiences. And neither of them are exactly, they happened to me kind of is what happened. So the worst would be online shopping. So online shopping is fabulous, except when it isn't. And it's really hard to match colors. So that beautiful quilt that I told you about that I made for my boyfriend, gorgeous, had finished it up. It has a lovely gray border on it. And I tried to buy fabric that would match that gray border and send it to the long armor to quilt it. She quilted it and they do not jive at all. They are completely different gray. So one is like a brown gray and one is like a blue gray. So when you see them both together, they just look terrible. I don't have the best eye for color, but I could have told you that those two didn't work. But buying it online, shipping it to somebody else to take care of and not being able to match the two was really kind of a disastrous thing and very frustrating because then I have this beautiful quilt that I'm like, but don't look at both sides at the same time. Okay. (laughs) It's not fun. The other one that happened was I brought my great grandmother's quilt along with me. I've been hand quilting it for way too long because I'm very slow at it. And I do, you know, maybe a block every few weeks, but I brought it along with me on our big trip last year. And I thought, oh, I'll get this whole thing quilted while we're out there. Turns out I didn't. But in one of the places, the window in the RV that we were living in was cracked and rain got in and got the quilt wet and I didn't realize it until it was very molded. And that was a heartbreaking experience. I washed the quilt several times and now there's an entire row that just has mold stains on it. And so I've left it. I've quilted a few more blocks up where it's fine still. And I'm still debating whether I take those blocks out 
and redo the quilt so it's a little bit smaller or do I leave them there as part of the story of the quilt? That's a disaster, you know, in the making. I think it's probably the worst quilting experience in my life. Like that was just a heartbreaking moment. And like I said, I still am not quite sure. And I keep being like, all right, grandma, what am I supposed to do? Let me know. She hasn't told me yet, but I'm waiting. That's one of those instances where your stomach just drops and you can't go back. No. And if I'd known, yeah, it was definitely one of those stomach drop moments. You're just the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What has drawn you to continue quilting rather than spend your time doing anything else? Because there's nothing else I'd rather do. <laughs> I love quilt making. I love sewing. I, I love that connection that quilt making has to the past and then also to the future. So we can see what people have done before us and we kind of replicate it. And then we make things that will be held on to in the future. And people will look back and look at ours in the same way that we look back at theirs. And I think that there's something really beautiful about that continuity of quilt making through generations. And I think that's part of the thing that keeps me going. And I also just love the beauty of the designs and the fabrics and the colors. And they're just very love and home that is in quilt making. And if I can keep that going, I'm, I'll do my part. It really does make me happy. Mm -hmm. I know you have to make a lot of projects for work, but other than that, who would you normally make your quilts for? So when I'm quilt making, I'm generally making them for friends or family Usually for a special occasion is kind of what I've been doing last few years. And mostly because my time is much more limited now to how much time I can spend on quilt making versus work making, which are two different things. And so for me, they have to be a very specific, special kind of project. I made a wedding quilt for my friend last year. I made that quilt for Hawk last year. I've been working on another quilt for myself for the last couple of years that I'll get done eventually. Otherwise, it's usually small projects that I kind of work on and that's what fills the gaps. But it has to be like a special occasion quilt at this point for someone that I really care about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I finally just finished one for myself. Out of all the Good. quilts I made, is I have two. <laughs> yeah, this will be my second. Yeah, I made my first one for myself in 2016, I think, 2017 was the first one I made for myself. And I was like, why has it taken me this long? <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I'm a quilt maker. And the people come to my house and I'm like, but I, I don't have a quilt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's one of my goals that the beds in my house should have quilts on them, but it will be a while. Do you have a special project going on right now? Well, I have a few special projects <laughs> and mostly because I was on the road all of last year that there were a lot of projects that I had had kind of in process that I had wanted to start that I had tried and then they kind of just got held. So the biggest thing is working on this American travel series that I had started back in 2021 and I want to keep going, which is really quilts that are based on things I've seen in America, things I've experienced. And I've got a lot of ideas for those. And I have two of them that are in process. So I think that I'll probably be spending the most time working on those. And those are very special to me because they're very personal. They're much more than just following a pattern or putting together a kit for the sake of sewing. These will be from my soul. That will be so neat to see. Teresa, share a quilting tip. I think my quilting tip might be that you should look at the first one that you do as practice, whether it's the first block or your first quilt, your first binding, it's just practice. We get better the more that we try, the more that we do it again and again, and we try those same skills over and over, you will get better. It gets easier. You find the flow. That first time is always practice. It really is because it's not going to be very good. And I tell people that in my class, like <laughs> when you're making something like this first one is practice, because I think sometimes we hold ourselves to a higher standard than we're actually physically capable of doing because we don't know how to do that. We don't have the muscle memory for it. We don't know where we're supposed to look on the machine or where we're supposed to hold the fabric. 
So those first ones are always going to be just a little off until we figure out how to do those things and get the finish that we want, whether that's, like I said, on a block, a quilt or binding, all of those require different skill sets that take some practice to get there. Mm -hmm. I always assume that quilting was a hobby first. So can you describe how your hobby became your job? Well, for me, I think I'm kind of lucky because my job requires sewing skills, but not always quilting skills. So the quilt making gets to be mine and that's lovely. So when I am making things or designing things, sometimes I can use them for work and sometimes I can design patterns for my own little pattern line. So I get to kind of keep the two of them apart, but my job is definitely from having a history of sewing and being very interested in sewing a lot of different things, because that's really what I'm teaching people how to do now is how to sew a lot of different things. And sometimes that involves quilt making. Sometimes it involves, you know, putting our fabric on the back of quilts or binding them with that fabric. But I always get to kind of like combine them in this really interesting way that actually does keep them a little bit separate. And I appreciate that they complement each other. My quilt making and my job complement each other, but they don't actually have to support each other. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to jump back since you didn't name Shannon Fabrics, but you did name Crinkle Dreams. How did you come up with that name? So I came up with the name Crinkle Dreams, oh, maybe 12 years ago or something. And I was out of college and I was looking for work and I had just started working for Fab Shop News and was in the industry. And I really wanted to start designing patterns. And so I started trying to think of names and figure out what to do. And it was kind of a dream of mine to have my own small business. So that was where the dream came from. And the crinkle is really because the thing I love about quilts is the crinkle that gets in them. I love, I love that deep crinkle from being washed over and over because it's been used and used and used. I I really do love it. So that was kind of where that came from is the crinkle dreams was, you know, dreaming about having a quilting business. That makes a lot of sense. How did you land the job with Shannon Fabrics? So I actually got the job at Shannon Fabrics while I was working for Fabric Depot up in Portland, Oregon, which was kind of a big, a Mecca store. It was a huge quilting sewing store that had been there for maybe 20 years. And I was working there. It was kind of like a dream always to work at the store because I had shopped there so much. And I was working there as social media and I just was kind of getting over the social media work. It's a young man's game. You know, (laughs) I was, kind of tired of figuring out like what posts do I put up today and what are the analytics saying? And I have to go look at Facebook some more. And I was like, I really still want to work in the the industry, but not so much in this part of the industry. And I had been teaching a bit at Fabric Depot and I really loved it. So I decided to start looking for teaching jobs. And then I found the education coordinator, I think is what the job was titled on LinkedIn for Shannon Fabrics. And I had worked with Shannon Fabrics when I was with Fab Shop News that we had worked together to like promote their fabrics through Fab Shop News. So I knew some of the people that were there. So when I saw the LinkedIn ad, then I messaged one off of LinkedIn and I was like, hey, so tell me about this job. And she did. And then she told me I had to move to California. So I was like, let me think about it. We'll see. And then I applied for it. Funny thing is that when I applied for the job, they sent me a little kit. So I had to sew up the kit and see how I liked it and all that good stuff. Funny thing is that I sewed it wrong. So I totally sewed it wrong the first time that I was like, um, could you maybe send another one? So they had to send me a second kit that I got to try out, follow the instructions this time, because even though I'm a quilter, I don't know everything. And I made it up the second time and I was like, this stuff is pretty great. So I ended up applying for the job and they believed in me enough to move me down to Los Angeles. And I started working for them then. Wow. Quite the journey for that. So you started teaching and can you think back to when someone first signed up for one of your classes and how exciting that was? Yeah, I think the first time that I really felt like, oh, wow, people signed up for my class 
was when I was working at Modern Domestic and I was teaching a bag making class and my name was on it. It wasn't just that people were signing up for the bag making class, but I was teaching the bag making class. And the same thing happened when I was at Fabric Depot. And that was really exciting that people wanted to take a class with me. That was really neat. It's very satisfying because I want to share the knowledge that I have and to feel like people would give me enough credence to do that, to share the information that I have with them was, it made me feel really good about myself. And it made me feel like I had some skills and some talent that I could share. And it really did encourage me to keep going. And now it's clear at the other end of that, where all the classes that I do are kind of with my name on it and people still sign up for my classes. And it's, it's very endearing every time, every time it's endearing that I'm like, they really do want to learn from me. This is great. We do. It's very exciting. I really do love it. Well, I need to share how I heard your name first. I have a Facebook group for this podcast. And one of the members, Shauna, and I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, Weedman, W-E-I-D-M-A-N, kept posting your videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So I need to thank Shauna for promoting you in my Facebook group because that's great. Anything that we can learn from. I appreciate that very much. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know her. So she's not doing it because I told her to. (laughs) I think I saw there where you had shared this for a prize. Mm -hmm. So I think she was maybe trying to get a prize. prize. So yeah, hopefully she got something. (laughs) <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> but that's really why we do it is because it's hard sometimes to find new teachers or shows or podcasts or books, like unless someone recommends it to you. So that's kind of the point of that is just trying to share the love, but also people will win. So, yeah. yeah. So Shauna, thanks for this introduction. You started making patterns for Crinkle Dreams. And do you remember getting that first purchase of one of your patterns? You know, it's been so long that I don't remember. But every time I get one, because I only have a few little patterns up there, this year will be my pattern making year. But I only have a few patterns up there. So every time I get a sale, I'm like, oh, look, somebody bought the pattern. Oh, look, somebody bought a pattern. Like Every time it brings a little bit of joy to me when Etsy makes that little sound for me and it tells me, oh, Somebody bought it. That's so great. Yeah. For some reason, my Merce quilt pattern sells really well in Germany. So part of that ding is trying to find it like, oh, is it another German? Oh, is it another German? (laughs) Oh, this one's from Austria. (laughs) It's very fun to see where they're from. And yeah, I don't have much. So the little sales are all very meaningful. And have you had the experience of seeing a quilt and realizing, oh, that's my pattern? Yes, I remember. Well, it wasn't a realization that it was mine, but I remember looking the first time on Instagram for the hashtag for Mirth Quilt and then seeing that people had actually made it and they posted about it and they'd done it in different fabrics and different colors. And to see what people have done with it is really it's my favorite part of designing any sort of pattern is just to see what people do with it. It's very exciting. Yeah. Can you tell us about what it was like to travel last year? So traveling last year was both the best thing I've ever done and the hardest thing I've ever done. So we were on the road, me and my boyfriend, who also works for Shannon Fabrics, we were on the road for all of last year. We got rid of our apartment in December of 21. And then we lived in the RV until January of 23. So we were on the road for a long time. We traveled from Los Angeles, Claire up to Maine. We got down to Tennessee and up to Seattle. We kind of did the whole crisscross. And it was absolutely wonderful to meet so many people from everywhere in this country and seeing how much we have in common. And it's one of the things that I love about teaching in quilt shops is that we could come together and there'd be, you know, 10, 15, 20 of us. And we could all just sit and talk for hours, hours about all the quilty stuff, all the patterns, the fabrics, techniques, tools, everything. And that was a lovely experience, very 
very bonding for me with America as a whole. And it was very impactful to me in ways that I'm still trying to uncover. I've only been in Kansas City since the end of February. So I haven't been here for very long and able to really kind of get myself sorted and off the road in my head. So I'm still trying to come up with the things that I learned along the way. There was a lot of things that sometimes the middle of doing something, I'll be like, oh, okay, that was definitely, that's, (laughs) sometimes it's PTSD. Sometimes it's just an echo from what happened or what I experienced or things that I saw. I think it will continue to affect me for years, which is really why I want to do this quilt series because I know there's so much that happened over the year that was good, bad, and like I said, really, really endearing to America and to quilters, sewists, creators, makers, all of them. Yeah, I love them all. And what a year to pick to travel like that coming out of COVID. It was a doozy. Is there anything else about Shannon Fabrics you wanted to share? Well, we do a weekly show. So we do a live tutorial for Shannon Fabrics that is every week it's based on sewing something with their microfiber plush fabrics, which they call cuddle. And every week we teach how to do a project. So they vary dramatically. If you're a quilter, we talk about adding it to a quilt as applique or on the back or for the binding. But we also do all sorts of fun projects. We have a bunch of things coming up, a robe and we've got a little cinch sack and I don't even know what else is coming. Stuffed animals. I love them. So that's really like my joy of working with the company is working with those fun fabrics and coming up with really creative ways of doing it. I'm very proud of the education arm that we've made for the company as a whole, that it's a fabric that sometimes can seem intimidating for people and they're unwilling to give it a shot. And I've tried really hard to make it much more accessible for people, if they want to give it a try, I don't expect everyone to love it, but I really appreciate it when people give it a shot. And I wanted to thank you for, I don't know if you reached out to her or she reached out to you, but your connection with Alex Anderson in her breast cancer journey. And how's that going with the project on that? It's been going really well. So We work together to create a mastectomy pillow that you can create to give away or to use for yourself if you need one to give them to hospitals. And so we work together to create this pillow that's sort of like an underarm pillow that helps with the ports that are there. And then she's been doing some sales with scarf kits to give to people who are undergoing chemo. And that's been really lovely. I think it's a wonderful way to kind of make the most of a bad situation and to use fabric that really does make the whole thing a little bit easier and softer, quite literally to deal with. She's been a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. And I really love that she invited us into this and me specifically to help her kind of promote this and to to do some good in the world. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you doing that. Very happy to have. Where can we find more information on Shannon Fabrics? So Shannon Fabrics, you can find their blog at shannonfabrics.com and see all of the fabric that they make. You can also find on YouTube, all of the Sew Together Tuesday shows, which is where we find the educational arm of that is there on YouTube slash Shannon Fabrics. And where can we find more information on you? So you can find more about me on my blog, which is teresacoats.com, or you can find my limited run of patterns at crinkledreams.com. Great. Again, thank you so much for sharing with me. I just love hearing your story. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh Uh-huh. Goodbye. Goodbye. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening.